There are two equally remarkable stories in the world of economics over the past year. One is the resilience of the Russian economy in the face of massive Western sanctions. The other is the dramatic reduction of Europe's dependence on Russian energy. The second story is remarkable because Europe did not go into a deep recession as a result. Indeed, the Eurozone economy grew faster than the U.S. economy last year, and the Euro has made a full recovery to its pre-war level against the U.S. dollar. How did this smoother-than-expected decoupling of Europe from Russia come about? What are its long-term costs? Is it possible that the European response to the war will one day undo the Euro? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former IMF economist and Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about the big story shaping our world tomorrow. The Euro hit a new year high against the dollar this week. With this latest move, the single currency has retraced all of its decline against the greenback in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This says a lot about the evolution of the market's view on the war and how it affects the different regions of the global economy. After the war broke out, it didn't take Wall Street very long to conclude that the conflict will have a greater negative effect on the European economy than on other major economies. Not only was Russia an important destination for European exports, Europe was also highly dependent on Russian energy. And the market was right. European inflation soon soared, while European growth slumped. This happened almost everywhere in the world, but in Europe, it was a bit worse. Given what I've just said, the full recovery of the euro is a testament to the dramatic reduction of Europe's dependency on Russian energy over the past 18 months. In the first quarter of 2022, 26% of the European Union's import of petroleum oil came from Russia. This share went to zero as of the first quarter of 2023. The shortfall was made up by increased imports from the US, Norway, and Saudi Arabia. In the first quarter of 2022, nearly 39% of the EU's imports of natural gas came from Russia. But by the first quarter of 2023, this fell to just 17%. Increased imports from Norway, Algeria, and the UK made up for most of the reduced imports from Russia. In the first quarter of 2022, 42% of the EU's imports of coal came from Russia. But by the first quarter of 2023, coal imports from Russia went to zero and had been replaced by increased imports from South Africa, Colombia, the US, and Australia. The long-term cost of the reduction of Europe's dependency on Russian energy has been masked to a great extent by the decline in global energy prices over the past year and by Europe's aggressive fiscal policy response to the war. The EU's trade balance for goods registered a record deficit of 432 billion euros in 2022 due to high energy prices. But since February this year, the EU's trade deficit has more or less returned to zero as energy prices dropped. No doubt the sharp improvement of Europe's trade balance has been a key driver of the euro's rally against the dollar. Separately, Thanks to massive fiscal transfers and subsidies, the EU's economy not only avoided a sharp recession, but even managed to grow 3.5% in 2022, faster than the 2.1% growth of the US economy. The fiscal support remains at 1.8% of GDP in 2023, only slightly lower than in 2022. This is why Wall Street has come to see the risk of a recession in Europe as being even lower than in the US over the next 12 months. The continued aggressive fiscal stimulus is also why the European Central Bank has hiked interest rates to the highest level since 2001. Narrowing interest rate differential between the US and Europe has been another reason for the Euro's rally this year. The strength of the Euro over the past few months reflects an improvement in the market's perception of the outlook for the Eurozone economy. The million dollar question is whether this improvement is durable or just a dead cap bounce. Over the past year, Europe has dramatically reduced its dependency on Russian energy by importing energy that has to travel a far greater distance 
to reach Europe. The absolute price of energy has declined, but the higher relative price Europe has to pay for energy compared to the Americas and Asia is adversely affecting the competitiveness of the European economy. Take the price of natural gas as an example. A year ago, from month European natural gas contracts were trading at 150 euros per megawatt hour. Today, they are trading at just 27 euros per megawatt hour. However, despite this decline, natural gas costs nearly four times more in Europe than in the US. This translates into higher relative electricity prices. German base low electricity spot price, currently at 96 euros per megawatt hour, is about double or even triple of midsummer levels prior to the pandemic. The fact that Europe has to pay more for energy is both a negative income and negative productivity shock. It makes European consumers poor and it makes European companies less profitable. Now, consumers cannot move easily, but companies can. And that's exactly what many of them are doing. BASF, the largest chemical company in the world that uses as much energy a year as all of Denmark, announced last year that it is permanently downsizing in Europe. It is expanding its US operation and building a 10 billion euros factory complex in China. Meanwhile, this February, the company announced the shutdown of a fertilizer plant in its hometown of Lübeck Seven, which led to about 2,600 job cuts. Siemens, Europe's largest industrial manufacturing company, unveiled last month a 2 billion euro investment strategy designed to increase its global production. It will be building a new high-tech factory in Singapore and expanding its digital factory in China. Volkswagen, the largest auto company in the world by revenue in 2022, is pivoting to China and North America. It announced in April that it would invest more than $5 billion in its planned battery cell factory in Canada, making it the company's largest such operation in the world and creating thousands of jobs. It also announced that it will be investing $1 billion in building an R&D center for electric vehicles in China. Consistent with the exodus from Germany, German domestic plant and machinery orders, a good proxy of capital expenditure spending in Germany, have been falling since the war started. Meanwhile, German companies invested a record 11.5 billion euros in China alone. It should come as no surprise that German unemployment rate has been rising since the war. Over the past 18 months, it's gone from 5% to now 5.7%. Survey data suggests that the worst has yet to come. In June, the employment expectations of the German Manufacturing Confidence Survey fell to minus 4.2, the lowest since February 2021. It is still higher than during the depth of the pandemic when global auto sales collapsed, but it is barely higher than during the Eurozone debt crisis in 2012. One thing is clear, not all is well for the largest economy in Europe that is also its engine of growth. The future of German manufacturing already looked shaky even before the war. Germany is the world's premium car production hub. Of all premium branded vehicles produced globally, 65% are of OEM German manufactured. The car industry is central to the German economy. It represents 25% of the revenue generated by the manufacturing sector and 10% of the gross added value of the entire economy. It directly employs around 800,000 people and another 150,000 if we include supplier companies. Much has been already said about how Germany has fallen behind both China and the US in the development of electric vehicles. Moreover, building electric cars requires 30% less labor than cars with traditional internal combustion engines. Studies show that the loss of jobs in the German auto sector resulting from the electrification of powertrains in passenger cars alone will be about 150,000 by 2035. And this does not even assume any loss of global market share of the German auto industry. 
Following the European Union's decision to ban the sale of new fossil fuel cars starting 2035 to combat climate change, Europe is now the second biggest and the fastest growing market for electric vehicles after China. KPMG estimates that by 2025, Chinese companies with affordable EV offerings catering to different consumer needs will grab 15% of the European market share. This could cost billions of euros of profits for German car makers. When Germany sneezes, Europe catches cold. Porsche makes its top-selling Cayenne SUV in Slovakia. Audi has been churning out engines in Hungary since the early 1990s. And Miele makes washing machines in Poland. Have no illusion the deindustrialization of Germany means the deindustrialization of Europe. Germans started buying Russian natural gas in 1973 at the height of the Cold War. Angela Merkel, the former German chancellor, said last year that she had no regrets in her decision to increase imports of Russian energy. Cheap Russian energy allowed Germany to compete with the US and China. But Germany has now decided to do without Russian energy. Or was it the US that decided that for Germany? Seymour Hirsch, an award-winning American journalist known for his work exposing the cover-up of the Mai Lai massacre in Vietnam, of the Watergate scandal and the torture at Abu Ghraib, alleged that the U.S. is behind the sabotage of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. If indeed it was the U.S., it should be of no surprise to the Germans. It was JFK who was responsible for a NATO embargo on pipe exports from Germany to the Soviet Union. Ronald Reagan repeatedly pressured Germany to reduce its imports of Soviet natural gas. George W. Bush opposed the construction of the Nord Stream Pipeline. And Obama was strongly against the Nord Stream 2. It is easy to understand the frustration felt by Washington. The U.S. provided most of Europe's defense against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, successive U.S. administrations felt that Germany was free-riding America's security umbrella against unfriendly regimes. It can be argued that if the U.S. had blown up the Nord Stream pipelines, it was acting in its own self-interest. But what about the leaders in Germany and in Europe? Are they right now acting in the interest of their own people, or are they just blindly following the orders from the U.S. regarding the war? An article in the Wall Street Journal last week caught my eye. According to the article, European leaders have grown more assertive on Ukraine even as Washington shows more caution. The article says that many European leaders who pushed for talks between Kiev and Moscow last year have come to the view that no deal on Ukraine can be struck until Putin is routed on the battlefield or leaves power. I don't know what future historians will say about the actions of the current crop of leaders in Germany and France today, but I know what Lucy said to Charlie Brown after he revealed to her that he replaced her little brother's much nuzzled security blanket. She said, in all of mankind's history, there's never been more damage done than by people who thought they were doing the right thing. Ukraine is in Europe's backyard. In my humble opinion, the unwillingness or inability of the current European leadership to prevent the Ukraine war from getting worse may one day undo the euro. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments on the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.